All right, so this is Talk to an Artist. Um, my name is Macy Leptoy. I'm the pastor of 723. Um, and today I get the awesome privilege to talk to Ilknur Oskar, the director of, and founder of our partner, Artstillery. Artstillery is an experimental performance nonprofit that empowers marginalized communities. And I've had the great privilege for about the past year now to work with Artillery and work with Il Knur on their work in Dallas. And I'm just amazed at not only the quality of the things you guys do, but the impact it has in West Dallas. So I'm super, super lucky to be a part of this. And I'm so glad you're here with me today. Oh, you just warmed my heart. heart it's super fun. Oh, yes. <laughs> we love so you. So I'm just, oh, I love you guys. <laughs> so I just have a few questions. Um, for you today. So the first question I want to know, and hopefully our listeners want to know, um, is what was your first kind of meaningful experience with art and theater? I have an answer for you. I have an answer. Great. I, w I was doing Chicago theater and uh, teaching theater and all that for years. And it always <laughs> shocked me that I didn't have like these really, truly, emotional like moments until I started doing this kind of um, groundwork and community storytelling with a Puerto Rican based theater company that um, I was a part of in Chicago in this small space and we kept on moving around but we were always based in community um, and that's when I started feeling like oh this is rules are being broken here it felt really good it felt really good and then you know I came to Dallas and then we workshop this show called Family Dollar and it's just a workshop and by like the third or fourth night there were gosh I think there were about like 60 people there again no marketing and they watched this thing happen you know outside of these three dilapidated shotgun houses and we were just testing. We didn't really know who we were. We knew we found a journal. We knew it was this woman's story. We had done research for a year. We had cleaned and we had been out there in like 100 degree heat, but like, what? What's happening? What are we doing? And then the last, it was like, it was like the first night we launched the workshop and the show ends and the audience is silent. Nobody's clapping. Everyone's just staring at us and they're not moving. And I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. And I couldn't, I didn't know what to do with it. Um, and I, and I, so I, I just, I stood up. I mean, I like worked my way through the crowd and I was like, hi. And everyone's like, hi. I was like, oh, okay. This kind of work has moments at the end okay and it was like the first time it just felt so real uh that 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 guttural work that breaking tradition that not confining ourselves with everything we were taught led to this journey that led to that end and it's an end that we see every time now it blew me away it just i couldn't even handle it Wow, that's incredible. I never heard that part of the story. You know, we've, we've talked about Family Dollar before, but I didn't realize it was so, like, it's been so, such a soon process or such a, like, a, you know, quick process to experience that kind of meaningful moment and then to be kind of where our story is today. That's incredible. It felt um, crazy. Yeah, it felt, yeah. It felt special. Wow. So, so I guess in kind of in tandem with that question, with that story, um, what inspired you to kind of create this thing called Artillery that we now know and love as this, you know, great community and performance uh, space and perform and people that get together and kind of bear their souls. What, what was the, you know, inciting incident behind this? That's a really great question. I, and in my head, there's a journey happening that, that led me to, it, there was a defining moment. There was a moment in which I was standing outside of a space that I was rehearsing in for a different production. And I had this, <sighs> this is <laughs> like a moment where I was like, what am I doing here? Why am I, I <laughs> like, 
six days a week and my voice isn't heard and the script is wonky and I'm just like, I was, and, it, and it was just my spirit. My spirit was saying, there is something else that you can do and provide a home for people like you that kind of just go, what is this? You know, um, and there were so many things that led up to that moment, but I remember exactly where I was. I remember where the sun was in the sky. I mean, it was very, very clear, very clear. And, you know, it had started with this idea of like, you can, you can follow all these rules that you were taught. You can create your seasons and get confined by, you know, surviving in spaces and you can get confined by having to do certain scripts and having to follow certain rules. And I was like, that's also not why I'm in performance art. Like, it's not why I'm in it. And, and that's for us, that speaks, you know, for artillery is that we wanted to create a space that thought in a different way. And it's this form of supported and organized chaos where everyone gets their voices heard, everyone from top to bottom. And we almost have like this structure that's more linear, you know, like they have me, they have to all deal with me. But like there's this linear structure with everything else where everyone can speak to what we're working on. And, and I know, and I've seen, cause I've worked with so many orgs, but more in Chicago, that that is really, really hard to develop. And it's really hard for organizations to do that, I think, in, not just in performance, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it takes a lot of work to get there, but you have to be okay with this, like, concept. We wanted to, we wanted to also be mindful that there were other people like myself, um, you know, like my partner, you know, Michael Cleveland, that there was trauma in experience. And we, without knowing it, became this place for just guttural street style, like, like no holds anything, um, still passionate about community narrative, um, but still passionate about performance, but not in the way that they've been having to do it and not in the way where they go to rehearsal and they feel bad about themselves leaving or that they don't feel like their voice is heard. And it's just, for me personally, I got tired of it. And I feel like we went <sighs> and said, let's wait, let's look around first and see that there are tremendously talented people that are saying, can we work with you? that are from the visual arts, that are from community locally around us, that are professors of history, professors of landscape architecture, small community churches. Um, imagine art stillery like this tree with all these branches and, you know, the, and, and the idea of like, where we don't audition, that's such a big deal for me and it will never change. Like, if the narrative speaks to you, if you've been a part of the journey, somebody could just speak one line out loud while we're doing just our reading where we're trying to figure out what we just wrote and we'll all look at them and we'll all say, it's you. Wow. And that's how it happens. And we'll say, mm -hmm. it's you. Is this a journey that you want to share with everybody? And so, you know, the, the cool thing is, is like, you don't have to make up objectives most of the time because you've been there you've been talking to the people that we've gotten the narratives from you've gotten inside their psyche like you've had this whole year you know and some people it's like six months but like to develop a character and develop the writing and and also what was really important is that because these people get so involved with this process they will come to me and they'll say Ikur, I don't feel like she would say this in this moment you know mm -hmm. and the whole team talks about it because I remember I was part of a show where it was like one writer, one devised piece, and there was no room for any voices, even though it was said to us there was room, but there wasn't. Because I went up to the writer and I said, this woman would never say this. She would never say this. It doesn't make sense. And I wasn't allowed to change one word. And I think that sat with me. Mm -hmm. um, 
that's a really long-winded answer to your question. It's beautiful. I mean, it's beautifully said. I mean, you talk about the fact that like art still is this collaboration and it's not a singular, you know, it's not a singular vision. It's all these people coming together to come, come to this, you know, it's the same river. And it's really kind of a beautiful metaphor for um, what's happening in communities across the world of like people are, want to be heard. Mm -hmm. you know, and you give them a space to be heard. Um, so in this, yeah, so in this kind of thing that's brand new almost, I feel like artillery is a really new concept. It feels, you know, fresh and shiny and something that like, ready. You know, yeah, it's got, it's got that like, it's got that beautiful, it's got that beautiful chaos quality to it, um, where everyone's kind of like, what, what is, what is this and what are we doing? but it's, it's holistic and healing. Um, so it's been this great, beautiful thing. Uh, but obviously there have been challenges along the way. Um, and you've obviously been here from the beginning. This was yeah, kind of your brainchild and, you know, Michael is part of it. Um, so what's been the most challenging learning curve so far of starting this thing from the ground up and figuring out who are we, what do we do and what's important to us? Hmm. Also a great question. A um, <laughs> couple of answers. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to say it was challenging, but it was a really cool experience to allow us to be really organic about how we were thinking through even naming the organization and being comfortable with the name changing over and over again and being comfortable with the mission statement changing and being comfortable with uh, who we were changing. Like, we didn't realize that our work was based in healing so much. We didn't know that. Um, and once we realized that, it was just this really beautiful moment where I stared at Michael and Michael was staring at me and he said, we're healing. Like, this is different. You know, and, um, and I think during this time, what's going to be really important for us is also to give space for people to have a time for mourning. Mm -hmm. We're trying to, you know, I'm trying to think about programming about that. Like, we're we're just in it right now, but afterwards we're going to have to mourn, like mourn family, mourn economic loss, uh, you know, mourn jobs. Like how do we provide that space for mourning? But at the same time, you know, the, I think what is a challenge for all nonprofit organizations, no matter how large they are, or how long they've been around is really developing a working board that supports you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and I just graduated from, you know, the business leadership, like Institute and got to hang out with a lot of really interesting people and learned a lot about what a working board is. And I would walk out of some of my meetings or, you know, our cohort training sessions and I would go, I can ask for that. Oh, I can ask for that. You know, and <laughs> I've never yeah. had a board before. Right. Um, and, and, and just to reawaken them, but also it's really important for the board and the, and the people that want to support Art Distillery to feel like they're part of something that is special. And so we've had to reignite our board. It is the most organized it's ever been. There's um, committees and there's uh, really wonderful positions for people to just slide right into and do their thing. And so that's been the biggest challenge is like empowering people to join this crazy organization that just wants to heal and help. And we're trying to figure out like, how do we speak that better to, to the general public? Um, but we also want to have fun. Um, yeah. And so I think that's the biggest wow. challenge is like finding the right board members and, and even committee members, like people that don't want to be part of a board, but like mm -hmm. love the idea of, you know, marketing, like they love it so much. Yeah, that's important for, I think for a lot of folks who are in the nonprofit work or in leadership is finding the right people makes a huge difference in what you're able to do and how successful you can be for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so in kind of conjunction with that, um, talk about the kind of the challenging learning curve of developing, you know, empowering people to be on boards and committees. So what's been the most rewarding moments and if you could think of like one kind of story to tell about where you thought wow this is why I do this that would be great to share with everybody 
<laughs> I know it's a huge question to ask. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Are you kidding me? You got this. I believe in you. Can you say that again? <laughs> so are there moments, is there one moment you think of? I know there's been countless, you know, I've been uh, March kind of on the, on the edge of this and just watch the, the incredible things that y'all have done and the, the incredible resp response you've had. But if there is, there's a, if there is a moment where you think you had to stop and look back and think, wow, this is why we do this. Um, is, is there a moment where you had a moment of realization of, yeah, this is why we do our distillery. This is why we do what we do. I don't mean to be so quiet. They're like in my head, it's, it's raining. It's raining it's rain. of memories. Like I see them, I hear them, I feel them. I feel them, mm -hmm. i crying right now, feel them. Like I feel it, it's coming up for me um, in a very emotional way. Mm -hmm. um, if we were together, I would hand you tissues right now, but I, I can't virtually give you a tissue. Yeah, you know, I'm such a staff. No. <laughs> um, so, okay. There's, uh, let me pick one. Um, okay. I know it's hard. <laughs> you know, coming off of Generations of Adam, there were so mm -hmm. many moments where I just couldn't. I just... We, okay, all right, I'll tell the Generations of Adam story. All right, and real um, quick, could you kind of give a brief description of what Generations of Adam is, if, in case people didn't um, get to see the show back in October? So Generations of Adam was um, a piece that we worked on for a year uh, based off of community stories of trauma, and we had to focus the trauma. Um, and during, you know, every piece that we do, we want to be culturally and socially relevant and use voices from the community that exists today. We want to use research that exists today. Um, and we did a lot of, um, we did mindful modalities, like embodied movement modalities with community members um, led by Conchetta, who does embodied movement work. Um, so we do all this and we launched this show called Generations of Adam. Sorry, mm -hmm. I, I get lost in all the memories because it's You're such great. a process. And Generations of Adam was this fully, you know, like immersive process. You walk in and every word that you hear is a narrative from local community and based off of research and based off of healing modalities and based off of storytelling um, that we had put together. And Lord, it was a ride. And so the people who give us stories sometimes, all the time, actually come see the work. And we had finished it one night and there was a person, I don't want to like give away who they are, yeah, there was a person no worries. who looked at me and said, I, I can't, I can't look at you right now. And I, I said, okay. And then they said, wait, but I can't, I can't hug you right now. I, I want to. And I said, okay. And then they came in for a hug. And I whispered in their ear, I said, did we give your narrative justice? And that person said, yes. I finally felt heard. And, um, you know, it's moments like that. Like when I go to other forms of theater, we clap, we get up, we go lobby, we chit chat, we talk about emotions and the piece, but just to, have an audience that is silent, silent, every time. Um, and to have these people's narratives and for them to tell us that we've given them justice or we've given them a place. For me, boy, that's, that's why I do this. You know, I, I have no interest in doing the Latino version of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. I mean, like, I don't need to do a narrative that's already been done over and over again. And that yeah. works for people. And I think it's beautiful, but it doesn't work for my spirit. I just can't. I have found this new love for writing pieces from scratch with these community members and architects and visual artists and, and blah, 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 blah. I mean, the list goes on and it's so awesome. What a powerful testament. I, I was kind of tearing up there like for someone to finally felt feel heard 
um, after so many years. That's a, that's a great tribute to what you guys do, which I think is beautiful. Um, that's incredible. Um, so uh, kind of shifting gears to a different uh, mindset, if you had no boundaries, no budget to worry about, no space constraints, nothing, I want to know what would be your dream production to do. And this is something that I like to do when I'm sitting on my couch sometimes, is dream of what I could do if I had all the money in the world to do things. <laughs> um, I'm sure a lot of us who are in quarantine right now have those dreams um, and who live um, in this uh, economy. <laughs> um, oh, sweet. Um, <laughs> so, Yes. So is there, is there something like a big, massive production that you're like, man, if I had no, if, I, if my imagination and my budget was limited, limitless, this is what I would do. You know, during these times, man, I'll, I'll take a hundred bucks, you know, I'll take $25. I'll make a show happen with $5. Like, uh, family dollar on $1. <laughs> We've done shows with nothing. That's the great thing is like, we're not sitting here suffering. <laughs> we're writing. We're being so active right now. It's so beautiful. We're listening mm -hmm. to what's happening. Um, all right. Well, for me, it's like, we've planned the next two years mm -hmm. and we haven't gone public with it. We don't really like go public with seasons. We're going to talk to our team members about it and We'll slowly start talking about things because we are writing them from scratch, but we have amazing collaborators right now for these shows. Like it's taken us three years to get to a point where like we have real organizations collaborating with us. And so that's a really great experience for us being a new org. Um, so for me, it's like any new project we're working on, I'll take some dollars, you know, like, <laughs> The, the big one, so, you know, we, we defined some things, we tweaked mm -hmm. and we talked and um, we have a couple of drive-in performances that we're working through, yeah. which guys are exciting. But when I think about where true money needs to go and like the larger pieces that we do, they're, they're devised pieces, we call them our devised pieces, you know, those cost us about 20 to 30 grand to make is what we've learned. Mm -hmm. So Dirty Turk costs us about 20 grand and so do generations and that's everything. And, and, you know, we pay, we pay our actors as well yeah. as we can. Um, and so <clears throat> the next one that I am so crazy about is working with these musicians um, and you and I have talked about it. Yes. Um, yeah. work, working with so these cool. the musicians um, that are, that are already pulled together by this lovely gentleman named Max up in New York and they've created a band and they've created narrative storytelling and they found us you know like a year ago and they were like man what you doing over there and i really like how you're collecting stories and like we do this show right like we go and we perform and we've got some projection mapping going on but we don't have the skill sets of like this team that you do and how you collect narrative is is becoming like clean like a clean system and um so I thought to myself why don't they just come here like why don't we do programming for three days for the community do a concert for them let other musicians local musicians share their craft with these musicians that you know one of them was kidnapped by Saddam Hussein to play for him professionally like mm -hmm. they are like these <laughs> fantastic musicians who had no home all of a sudden and that are here in the States being line cooks, like, yeah. And that vibes with me, right? You know, yep. I got that narrative with, with my dad and, and watching him relearn the language and his certs not coming over here from Turkey. I mean, I lived it and it was uh, very powerful and it's left an effect on me. And um, so we would work with them and what we would do is we'll have three days of programming with them here and then the next three to four days, we're going to have intensive collaborative storytelling and mindful sharing and collect narrative and then create a device piece using these live musicians, their stories, projection mapping, performance. Um, and 
so that that's what's important to me. And I want to go to their homes and talk to them and their families about their experiences and then run that show here in Dallas for like two months. So if I had all the funding in the world, that's what I would want to do is that piece. And I'll keep sort of do it anyway. We're going to yeah. do it to the best of our ability. If I need right. to get me a second job, I would get me a second job. Like I will make it happen. <laughs> you know, but like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that piece of, I know, yeah, we've talked about it before and just the, the idea of telling the stories of refugees who have come here, I think not only is a beautiful um, example, again, of what our story does, but also is so very needed, um, you know, in a country founded by immigrants, that's the line from, I think, the Hamilton mixtape, immigrant has somehow become a bad word, mm. which, you know, I, you know, we, we've talked about our own uh, family immigration stories, and it's, yeah, I think it's a, it's a good reminder, and it's a really powerful tool. Um, so along with kind of this storytelling with refugee musicians who have come over here and, and are, you know, finding their way in America, what else, if you can tease a little bit, can we expect to see from our story in the near future? I know I'm excited. I, I kind of know what's happening, but <laughs> if we can, if we can like kind of tease out for people who are big fans of art stillery. Like building size puppets are pretty cool, right? Like That is true. <laughs> <laughs> You heard it here first, folks. We are building life-size puppets. Get ready. Like, that could take over an entire, like, house. That's going to be great. <laughs> That's not going to happen without some help. <laughs> yeah. So if you want to be part of it, I'll tell you how you can help. Um, so this is my, I got two more questions for you. Um, and these are my fun questions that, well, I think they're fun. I don't know if you think they're fun, but I think they're goofy. Um, so this one, so since we're all kind of stuck in this stay-at-home like we don't know what's going to happen phase and we don't have a you know an end date necessarily to this um I know a lot of people have spent a lot of time kind of working on themselves and thinking about you know, who they are at least I have I don't know if other ones are doing that but um so I thought about what would be you know the one either book or film either one that you would recommend for everyone to read or watch during this stay at home order. So what would that book or film be and why would you recommend that for everybody? <laughs> for those two people watching. I'm hey. sure they're like super stoked to hear what my answer is. You never know. What's that girl reading? <laughs> I'm excited to hear. Can I be like, okay. I thought about this. Yes. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna really, give you an answer that comes from like a deep down space Perfect. which is so many people during this time have given me books and movies right <laughs> but it's subjective during this stay at home order and I'll tell you why because my spirit sometimes can't handle hunters on Netflix about <laughs> like okay so and then sometimes it just can't handle like the heavy stuff it just can't and and I know if we weren't going through this together, that maybe my spirit could handle it. And I'm noticing that some nights my spirit can handle watching freaking Naked and Afraid because I'm like, <laughs> I don't have to think about anything. And like, watch I love Naked and Afraid episode yesterday. And like, we'll never watch another one. But like, or, you know, um, there's a great show by Mindy, Mindy Colling, Colling. Oh, yeah. I it's so. a bunch, bunch of teenagers, but I ate it up because I just needed, I needed a really light but insightful narrative. So it is hard for me to give recommendations because people I love have been giving me great ones, but my spirit's like, oh, yeah. I, can't, I can't take it, you know? And mm -hmm. so it's a terrible answer. It's a, it's a great answer. Well, you give them permission to everyone to chill out, you know? No. You like, don't have to. Yeah. We don't, it's like the biggest thing I've learned is like, we don't have to prove our relevance right now. We Ooh. don't as artists have to create anything right now. You don't feel like you, we don't have to feel like we're part of this rat race right now. Yeah. Like it's okay as an artist to sit back and just listen and breathe and write and tap in with bettering yourself if you can, if you want to, you know, 
really powerful thing for me has been like through the Embry Foundation and being trained to be a storytelling blanket facilitator. And that's my first thing I want to do when we come out of this is like a community morning session. And yeah. I, I don't, my spirit is, is not about running the rat race on social media. It's not, mm -hmm. I, what, what I'm doing is I'm writing, I'm writing, you know, one of our next puppet shows called COVID chicken. With a I love it. I love COVID chicken. I love the title. I, I wish it. the show could just be the title. <laughs> it's so great. We're writing that and we're writing this other show called Alice, which the name will change, but it's just a, you know, placeholder. And that's what we're doing. We're just getting organized and we're creating work. But if somebody on our team says, I can't, can't, can't for a month, I can't for a day, even when we were not in this stay at home order, we always say, okay, yeah. okay. What are you need? What are you needing to work on? What kind of space do you? Need? What a great contrast to the way the world has worked and is continuing to work. Like that's a, I think that's a beautiful statement to my very goofy question of book recommendations. <laughs> you always give the best answers of like I ask some dumb question. You're like, there's this beautiful poetry about how we're better people. I'm like, thank you. Oh God, you make me feel like I'm really like normal and special. Thank you. Appreciate you are special. It. Everyone is special. That's the, that's the whole point. Um, all right. So this is the question that, you know, you kind of prepared for some other ones, but this is the question that we're going to keep it to one sentence and you have not prepared for it. I know. Get ready. <laughs> so the question that I want to ask is, um, and I got this question from another podcast I listened to, which is a really great podcast, but, um, they always ask, uh, if you could broadcast one message to the whole world, what would it be? What podcast is this? <laughs> it's called Wild Ideas Worth Living, and it's done by REI. I am writing this down. It's a great, it's a great podcast. It's all about, she, her whole thing is um, inspiring people to go out and live their wild ideas. You are actually be a great guest on that show, too. <laughs> I'm going to write to her and tell her to have you on. I'm mine right now. <laughs> So yeah, so if you had like one, if you could like send out one postcard or one radio message and it was, you know, maybe two sentences long and you, and the whole world would hear it and receive it and have it sink in, what would that message be? I hate you so much right now. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm gonna put Jeopardy music in here. Can I have the Sarah McLaughlin song, like Arms of the Angel or something? Yeah, I got you. R.E.M. Um, I think the, the first sentence is just something I had said before during this talk, and it's, we don't have to prove our relevance to anyone. Mm. And the second sentence, since you're giving it to me, <laughs> thank you. You're welcome that we still need to be so loving and kind right now and to understand that other people are in different kinds of mental spaces mm. every day. Well said, well put. I want that on a t-shirt or on a bulletin board or something. Hey, I'm trying to figure out what an articulated <laughs> t-shirt would look like. If you have anyone out there as ideas, yeah. I just like open it up to the world because I'm just trying to find the softest t-shirt right now. That is my oh. three. So if anyone has the softest t-shirt, look at who made it. Okay. I got one for you. I'm going to, so I'm going to promote this brand, even though they're not offering sponsorship right now. It's called uh, young Maven. I think that's what it's called. J U N V E N M A V E N. I think I might be wrong. You're going to have to text that to me. Yeah, I got you. Um, but this is the, one of the softest t-shirts I've ever worn, and it's one, it supports the earth. It says, love your mother. Love oh. her. I know, right? I know. It's, so, we need to be supportive of her, because right yes. now she's like, ha-ha, I'm winning right now. <laughs> Sucks, you all need a time out, and so I gave it to you. <laughs> is this the way I needed to teach you? Is this what I, um, you pushed me too far. Like, <gasps> oh. I am mother nature. Like, yep, yep. <laughs> Uh, well, I want to thank you so much for joining me on this uh, lovely Monday afternoon.
Hmm. Um, and you can support Art Stillery by donating to them at artstillery.org backslash donate. Um, you can also do it through Venmo, which is my preferred option of donating to things, at artstillery-artstillery. Did I get that right? Oof, I want to roll today. Um, you can also support the continued ministry of 723, which is the home of Artstillery, um, by texting LLUNC to 77977. You choose Young Adults as a drop down box. Did you hear that? Yeah. Okay, great. Sorry, my uh, Siri decided to work through its thing. It's been annoying all time, the whole time. Um, we'll get back to that. So 77977, choosing Young Adults in the drop down box and putting 723 in the memo, and we will get that, and we'll be continuing, we'll be able to continue operating our space, and having great programs like Art Stillery be mm. part of um, our work in this community. So thank you so much for giving your time, um, and you can see us every Tuesday um, on Artist Talks, and I think next week I have Poppy Zander as my guest. So, Yay! Yeah, it's gonna be fun. All right, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me.